Our theme for this year is Us and Them, the Paradox of Difference and Inequality in a Global Age. A special welcome to the close to 300 students in the audience here. I'm sure you will find the topics discussed today very close to our own lived realities. What is this paradox of difference and inequality? We live in contradictory, and some may even say dangerous times. Even as we celebrate difference and valorize it as diversity and multiculturalism, we also see difference as routinely devalued, criminalized, stigmatized, brutalized, objectified, forced to hide, to be shamefaced, othered, incarcerated, and held with suspicion. A hint of an accent here, a headscarf there, a hoodie or a dark face everywhere, readily recognize signs of our times. Our distinguished speakers today will map out the production and management of difference in everyday lives of communities, the emerging multiple and intersecting identities, and the dynamics of power that discipline bodies. They will explore three kinds of experiences that make up this paradox. The immigrant laboring body that underlies our social economies, the stigmatized, brutalized body that satiates the incarceration industry, and what ph philosopher Jaspir Parr has called the orientalized terrorist body, which animates our imagination and ideology of national security. We invite you to reflect and engage with these thought-provoking ideas and how, within our institutional spaces, we can enable just and equitable responses to the paradox of difference and inequality. The link between education, experience, policy, and social justice need to be part of our education. This conference is a collective effort by the, led by the Associate Dean of HHS, Watina Davis, and the steering committee members, Jason Ambrose History, Judith Broom English, Maria Kromidas Anthropology, Natalie Obrek Psychology, Ryan Rebe Political Science, Elizabeth Victor Philosophy, Stephen Thompson Philosophy, Meg Devlin Deans of, from the Dean's Office, and myself, Sri Vidya Kalaramadam from the Women's and Gender Studies Department. This event is co-sponsored by the Office of Sophomore and Junior Experience, Africana World Studies, Anthropology, History, English, Geography, and Urban Studies, Languages and Cultures, Philosophy, Political Science, Psychology, Sociology, Women's and Gender Studies, Public Policy and International Affairs, the Center for Teaching Excellence, and the Social Justice Project, a truly multidisciplinary effort. A special thanks to the following people who are central in making our day run smoothly. Patrick Ryan, Assistant Director, and Roderick Holliday, Engineer, from the Broadcast Production and Support Services of the IRT for promising to take care of our demands in recording and archiving this event, Manny Coley, Associate Director, and Clint Voltman, Assistant Director of Hospitality Services, and all the staff members from the Dean's Office who coordinated our catering, printing, and publicity tasks. We also recognize the presence of Director Robert Fullman and Associate Director Richard Byer from the William Patterson Police here. Thank you all for being here. I now call upon the Dean of HHS, Kara Rabbit, to give the welcome address. Thank you. It is truly my pleasure to be here uh, to welcome you to the fourth annual College of Humanities and Social Sciences Multidisciplinary Conference. This event, which was really the vision um, of the College Council and the Associate Dean, Martina Davis, has grown in its impact through the years, uh, touching students, community members, faculty, engaging us all in a real chance to look at the questions of our times. Um, and today's conference topic is, as was very well pointed out by Dr. Kalaramadan, really at the heart of what it is that we study in the humanities and social sciences. In today's world, otherness and difference, constructed categories of identity that shift along continuums have profound political impacts. Um, they have philosophical charges that lead us in decision making, whether we know it or not, and we'll be exploring that today. They lead us in how we engage with each other, and they really are the key of what it is to be educated, is to have a, to take that step back and engage critically 
with examining their bases and their impacts. Um, so I, I couldn't be more pleased with the topic that the faculty committee has come up with. You made my job far easier. I was going to refer to my cheat sheet and go through the list and thank everybody. Um, but really, the, the faculty committee that pulled this together this year has uh, drawn on an extraordinary wealth of intellectual engagement across the country um, in some compelling questions for our study today. Um, they've brought in very wonderful speakers, um, which we're happy to welcome. And they've, they've pulled you in and invited you to be present, um, to really think about what it is that we study in the humanities and social sciences, what it is to engage as an educated citizen in the 21st century um, world that we live in. So thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody who has put this together, um, from the graduate assistant who was swiping your card, to the, to the co-chairs of the committee, to uh, the speakers who are visiting us, and to the faculty committee as a whole. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Rabin. Our first panel is um, on exploiting difference, immigrant experience, and citizenship. We have two distinguished speakers. Our first speaker will be Professor Alicia Galvez, who comes to us from Lehman College, New York City. She is a cultural and medical anthropologist and associate professor of Latin American and Puerto Rican studies at Lehman College, CUNY. Currently, she's also the director of the Jaime Lucero Ma Mexican Studies Institute. Her BA is from Columbia University and uh, MA and PhD from New York University. Professor Galvez's research is focused on Mexican migration to New York City, especially on the religiosity and the role of religious organizations in channeling migrant organization and activism, pregnancy and childbirth among immigrants, and the ways in which they are perceived by the public health system and changes in food habits and food systems in Mexico and the US and their relation to trade and migration. She's author of two books on Mexican immigration, uh, Patent Citizens, Immigrant Mothers, Mexican Women, Public Prenatal Care and the Birth Rate Paradox, published by Rutgers in 2011, and another book, Guadalupe in New York, Devotion and the Struggle for Citizenship Rights Among Mexican Immigrants, published by NYU Press in 2009. In addition to these books, Professor Galvez's publications include uh, Immigrant Citizenship, Neoliberalism, Immobility and the Vernacular Meanings of Citizenship, um, and The Original Dreamers, published in The American Anthropologist. Today, she presents Unintended, unintended Consequences, Immigration, Exclusion, Violence, and Citizenship in Post-1965 United States. It's my great pleasure to turn things over to Professor Alicia Galvez. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizing committee who put together this fabulous conference. It's uh, a distinct honor to be involved, um, and everyone has been so nice to work with. I want to do a little experiment. I hope that you guys trust me. Um, close your eyes for just a moment, and raise your hand if you believe the following sentence to be true. Be honest. No one will remember who said what. Uh, close your eyes, and if you believe the following sentence to be true, raise your hand. Migration to the US from Mexico is at an all-time high. OK, hands down. Uh, next question, raise your hand if you believe it to be true. Keep your eyes closed. Mexicans are more likely to be in the US without papers than people from other countries. OK, hands down. And finally, one more question. Raise your hand if you believe the following statement to be true. A rise in immigrants to a city means a rise in crime. OK. OK, open your eyes again. Um, we'll talk about some of those ideas. Um, just so you know that you had your eyes closed, uh, there were lots of hands raised on, on many of the questions. So if you raise your hand, you are not alone. Um, and there were lots of hands not raised, and so there's a difference of opinion, and we know that this, t this is true in our country as well. Um, 
I didn't get a chance to watch the debate last night, but listening on NPR this morning, I know that immigration came up again as one of the major discussions. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about it uh, today. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson signed the Hart Seller Act, uh, one of the most significant pieces of immigration reform legislation in US history. That act eliminated the quota system that had previously restricted the number of visas granted to people from most of the countries of the world, especially Asia and Africa. While it was touted as equalizing, it's perhaps the case that the Congress members who voted for it, many of them might have imagined that it would, in its emphasis on family unification, not, in fact, lead to a great, greater diversity in the United States. And in fact, some of the legislators at the time were quoted, and Lyndon Johnson, when he signed it, were quoted saying, this isn't a big deal. This isn't really going to change things. At the time of the passage, 5% of the bill's passage, 5% of the US population was foreign born. This is in contrast to 1920 at 15%, and today at 14%. Because the bulk of the early 20th century migration was from Europe, some lawmakers imagined that placing an emphasis on family unification would ensure a replication of the existing foreign born population. Instead, the 1965 law ushered in a new phase of American diversity and enabled many of the immigrants in the 60s, 70s, and 80s to reunite with their families in the US, families with origins in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Paradoxically, the law's elimination of racial quotas for the rest of the world actually signified the first major limitation on migration to the US from Mexico and Central America. Those, countries' migration had previously been unregulated um, and then was slightly regulated but mostly fluid with the Bracero program. But after 1965, visas for Mexicans and Central Americans were capped and deemed it, demand has exceeded supply for most of the next four decades and into today, a major factor in the creation of the large unauthorized population today. Um, so we can see here the dramatic rise in the foreign-born population after Hart Seller. This graph demonstrates the rise, demonstrates the way that many people think of immigration to the US as a dramatic upward shift in the last few decades. And you can see really after 1965 the, the steep um, change in, in migration. And then we see the projected uh, change after 2015 if migration continues at the same pace. But if we see at this if we look at these slides, we see that in 1910, the foreign-born population of the United States was 14% of the nation's total. And you can also see um, the labels on the states are the states are the nations from which that state's uh, most numerous immigrant group originated. Uh, so you can see largely a European migration with Germany leading. Um, again, constituting 14.7% of the, of the US population. What we don't often hear in today's immigration debates is that in 2013, the nation's immigrant population was actually lower than it was in 1910. Uh, the percentage is 13.1% today. So while if we go back, this slide is true in terms of the numbers of immigrants in the United States, we have to remember that the US native born population has also grown. And so the percentage of immigrants in our country has actually uh, not reached the levels that it had in 1910, in spite of a lot of the anxiety and discussion about migration that we hear in the news today. Um, what has changed, however, is the um, composition of immigrant groups. So we can see that um, in terms of foreign-born population, 11.6 million are, uh, were born in Mexico. Mexicans constitute about the same number of authorized immigrants, at, or about the same percentage of authorized immigrants as they do of unauthorized immigrants. So they're proportionally represented. There's not actually uh, a big difference between um, how many Mexicans are authorized or unauthorized compared to other groups. But what has changed dramatically since those early days um, and since 1965 and the Hart Seller Act uh, 
is the composition of the nation's migrants as well as the color of their skin. So if we look here, we can see between 1960 and 2013 a diversification of the immigrant population. Um, we can see that immigrants in the U.S. went from being 84% European to only 14% in the last five decades. Overall composition of the country has also changed. So we can see, uh, again, a trend towards greater diversification, even though um, whites still constitute the majority. So we'll talk about that today and why I think there's um, that change has something to do with the anxieties or the anxieties um, are related to that. So we'll come back to that. The, uh, so this is what Samuel Huntington has called the Hispanic challenge. Um, may he rest in peace. His polite and academic sounding treatise worried about the threat that the quote flood and deluge of Spanish speaking migrants posed to the US and its creed. When I'm teaching about immigration, I often ask my students, what kind of words are flood and deluge, right? Flood, never a good thing. <laughs> New Jersey, you have a lot of trouble with flooding, I know. So these are not words that inspire calm or confidence. Um, so just using the, that kind of language already is um, setting the terms of the debate um, towards uh, feelings of anxiety and concern and disaster. Um, so he, he posited that, um, that Hispanics were less likely to learn English, less likely to um, assimilate, more likely to live in ethnic enclaves, and that they posed a threat in their large numbers to a very specific white Anglo-Protestant worldview. Um, this was you know, published in Foreign Affairs um, more than a decade ago, um, but this is very similar to what we hear today when we hear certain politicians talking about wanting their country back. Um, in reality, statistics really um, defy these characterizations of immigration as a flood or as a deluge. And so I'm going to explore some of that in a few moments. But first, let's explore a little bit the half century since Hart Seller. The elimination of racial quotas signified by Hart Seller and the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, enabled many people to immigrate with visas to come with regularization, regularized status or to regularize their status, reunite their families in the United States, and naturalize. Since 1986, this is really important, since 1986, there's been no new immigration favorable to immigrants, uh, immigration legislation favorable to immigrants. On the contrary, there have been significant restrictions on regularization of status. In 1996, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which we sometimes refer to as IRA-IRA, was explicitly punitive to immigrants. Responding to growing anti-immigrant sentiment that held that immigrants were a drain on public services, the legislation made even legal permanent residents elig illegible for public benefits, including Medicaid and Medicare in the first five years of their residency. And it also prohibited consumption of public benefits by anyone in other visa categories in the process of a change of status or unauthorized, except for some very small exceptions of temporary protected status and other kinds of status. The, thing, the other thing that IRA, IRA did, which is really important, is that it classified as deportable felonies under immigration law, a whole host of civil infractions. So in other words, something that's a misdemeanor under criminal law within immigration law can count as a felony, and any felony can count as grounds for deportation. So what we see is a big shift in the legal context towards criminalization of immigrants and a method by which many thousands of people a year, um, two million people since, since Obama took office, have been deported following convictions for things that ordinarily, you know, in our, we colloquially refer to as uh, getting things that get a slap on the wrist, right? Um, another important part of this is that this intersects very um, dramatically with the plea bargaining system um, in the criminal justice system where uh, people are encouraged to take a plea bargain to plead guilty to an offense in, in exchange for a lesser sentence 
But when that intersects with the immigration system, what happens is that people are not advised and their, and their defense attorneys often don't know, now not so much, but for a couple of decades did not know that that could result in their deportation. So you have people pleading guilty to very small offenses, receiving little or no jail time, but then being slated for deportation and made eligible for deportation by that criminal conviction. Um, some have classified the current situation in which 11 million unauthorized immigrants reside in the U.S. as an unintended consequence of the last 50 years of policy. Others have characterized it as a rather more sinister construction of a hyper-exploitable, vulnerable immigrant underclass, disposable, abject, and deprived of the rights of citizenship. So I want to explore this today by confronting head-on some of the big ideas that help um, us understand this, this construction in these discourses about immigrants. Um, so a couple of the things that you know, we can talk about when we're talking about these issues is the idea of a line. Um, one of the popular things that Congress people say when immigration comes up is people should get in line and no one should be able to cut the line. Um, one of the important things to remember is that for most people who are living in the United States without authorization today, there was no line to get into when they migrated. Um, the U.S. does not offer special visas for people to do jobs that are lower level skills. Um, only very highly specialized um, labor visas uh, are allowed. Um, people from some countries are uh, much less able to get visas even for tourism, um, let alone work visas. Uh, if you don't have someone who can sponsor you, you can't get a visa to migrate, to, to reunite, even if your family members are, are living here. They also have to have status. So there's really not a line for many of the people who are living here without authorization to get into or to have gotten into when they migrated here. Um, the other thing is there's been a blurring of understanding about national origins. So I direct the Jaime Lucero Mexican Studies Institute, so I'm very... Um, alert to, to these sorts of blurrings, but one of the things that happens is that we get to see the immigration debate hover around ideas about Mexicans in the United States. Um, and in, uh, an erasure of other kinds of stories, um, and a blurring about immigration status, right? So not only are um, a lot of people thrown into the pile of, uh, of being Mexican if they're immigrant, Mexicans are assumed to be immigrants, right? And, and there are um, lots of populations, Mexican populations in the United States who say they never crossed the border, the border crossed them, right? They've been in the territory that is now the United States for hundreds of years, m many generations. And yet there's this blurring and this attribution of immigration status to people on the basis of how they look um, and because of their national origin and ethnicity. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these ideas, some of these um, big ideas that help push the discourse in certain directions in our country. So myths of criminal migra migration, criminal migrants, myths of hyperfertility and anchor babies, um, and unaccompanied minors. But first I want to talk about anchor babies, quote unquote. Um, so here, getting ready for Thanksgiving, right? We have um, a, a joke about the quote unquote original anchor babies. Um, so, do you get it? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Nobody laughed. I thought maybe it was confusing. Okay. Um, Okay, so we, here we have the American Heritage Dictionary definition from 2011. Um, I want you to imagine this dictionary definition without two words, because when this dictionary definition was originally published in 2010, it was missing two words that appear here. So I'll read it to you with, with the two words that were uh, missing, omitted. Uh, anchor baby, noun used as a term for a child born to a non-citizen mother in a country that grants automatic citizenship to children born on its soil, especially when the child's birthplace is thought to have been chosen in order to improve the mother's or other relatives' chances of securing eventual citizenship. So when a dictionary decides to print a new term, like this one was a new term in 2010, it's making an editorial decision. It's acknowledging the existence of an idea in the world. Right? And so if you were pay paying close attention, you'll notice the words offensive and disparaging were missing in the 2010 definition. This was being represented as a thing in the world, that people come to this country um, 
uh, that children that there's such a thing as a name for a child born to a non-citizen mother. Um, and it was only after protests by lots of scholars and students and activists saying this is not a thing in the world. This is actually a term that is only used pejoratively. Right? You're not going to see um, this being acknowledged as a thing in the world by scholars because the reality is that there's no statistically significant evidence that families choose to immigrate to this country in order to give birth on U.S. soil or that they perceive their child as the means in which to legalize their own status or that of their other family members. Um, so this is really important, right? Um, sociologically, I know this is an interdisciplinary conference, so I assume there's people studying political science, sociology, anthropology. Sociologic, sociological significance is important, right? There has to be people doing this in significant numbers in order for it to be a thing in the world. Um, so the American Heritage Dictionary took a step back and analyzed and realized that they were mistaken in, in uh, publishing this definition without those terms and then added the terms offensive and disparaging because that's really the only place that you're going to see this terminology used. And you'll hear it used on um, the news. But first, I want to um, provide a little bit of um, data for you. So as we can see in this, uh, in this chart from uh, the Pew Research Center, births occurring between March 2009 and 2010 um, to unauthorized immigrants. So these are babies born in 2009 to unauthorized immigrants. 91% of their parents arrived before 2007, more than two years prior to the birth of the child. 61% um, of them arrived more than five years before the birth of the, of the child. Only 9% had actually arrived in the last two years uh, prior to the birth of the child. So we can see overall nationwide there's not a significant number of people showing up uh, to give with the purpose of giving birth. Um, as Ondagneo Sotelo wrote, um, immigrants don't choose to have children in the U.S. They have children in the U.S. because this is where they live and work. And the overwhelming majority of the evidence shows that people come here to work and to uh, make a living. And at some point when they want to have children, your productive labor years also happen to be your productive childbearing years, the two coincide. Um, but there's really very little evidence that people are making this sort of um, uh, clever calculation about how to secure immigration status for their, for their families. Um, but that doesn't stop the debate from really um, going very deep in this country. So this is the honorable senator from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, who said on Fox News uh, five years ago, people come here to have babies. They come here to drop a child. It's called drop and leave. To have a child in America, they cross the border go to the emergency room, have a child, and that child's automatically an American citizen. That shouldn't be the case. Um, there's a small phenomenon, there is indeed a small phenomenon uh, of medical tourism and even birth tourism by which women from some countries obtain a visa and pay out of pocket for penthouse birthing suites at private US hospitals, which by the way are very happy to provide this service, um, and give birth to their children and obtain a passport before returning to their countries of origin. Again, with the discussion I, um, sh I began with, we don't see people really being able to get visas to do that who are in the um, imaginary category of, of these mothers of anger babies that Lindsey Graham is referring to. Um, this does not seem to be who Graham is concerned with, these sort of birth tourists. The image of, the woman, of women crossing the border on foot, bellies distended, probably taking steps between contractions, is much more compelling to Graham and others' imaginations. And that's where we see this sort of boogeyman of the, of the anchor baby idea come into play. Um, and it's so compelling that you have Graham and a few of his congressional colleagues in 2010 bring forth a, a proposal for a constitutional amendment. Remember that a constitutional amendment, unlike a law, requires a two-thirds majority in Congress. And they, uh, I can't get that majority, but they keep trying, um, and they would like to eliminate birthright, citizen, birthright citizenship, which is uh, um, promised by the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So you may recall from U.S. history that the 14th Amendment was passed in the post-Civil War Reconstruction period when freed slaves were counted as, as three-fifths of a person. Um, and uh, not allowed to vote. 
And after the 14th Amendment, we can see, and I highlighted here, um, the very important word person. No person born in the US um, could be denied the rights of citizenship, equal protection under the law, due process, et cetera. So this is significant because when we're talking about citizenship within the US Constitution, we are usually talking about rights accrued to persons, um, not citizens specifically. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. Um, we can see over the last several decades, not only in the US, but in many countries in the global north, that rising levels of diversity diversity and human mobility have led to a tightening of the category of citizenship toward greater exclusion, right? So this amendment was, was put into the Constitution at a moment when the U.S. was trying to recover from one of its worst and most violent and most destructive chapters um, by ensuring greater inclusion to the notion of citizenship. But we can see as diversity increases in the last five decades, a tightening of that concept of citizenship and a narrowing of it and a desire on the part of many to remove the category of citizenship, make it unavailable to larger numbers of people um, in ways that really require us to have a consciousness about the history and how, you know, under what circumstances and what contexts these sorts of um, expansions and contractions of citizenship have happened in the past and whether we really want to start um, dredging up those ideas and reviving them. Um, we know that racialization and white supremacist ideologies have meant that even after the 14th Amendment, citizenship has been no guarantee of equal treatment. And part of social science's interest in citizenship is precisely to interrogate that category of citizenship beyond the juridical legal premise that it implies, to try to examine what right people have to rights, who has the right to rights, who has the right to belong? Um, and sometimes we loop this uh, within the idea of um, substantive, excuse me, substantive citizenship or cultural citizenship. Um, but even if we limit ourselves to only the legal definition, we see a paradoxical elevation of the concept of citizenship at the same time that its promise is limited to ever narrower categories of people. The result has been the production of large bodies of, uh, sorry, of large populations of geographically incorporated, but juridically excluded unauthorized populations, right? So does that make sense, right? People living within our borders, but yet still excluded from the legal protections um, accorded by our constitution, not to citizens, but to persons, right? But yet as persons excluded from those protections. Um, the imagined association after 1965 between people of color and immigrants, and since 1986 between immigrants and unauthorized aliens has created a slippage effect wherein people of color, especially those marked by language and accent, as the professor said in the introduction, religion or any number of other markers, are imagined to constitute part of an abject and rightsless underclass, right? Um, my colleague Arlene Davila says, human beings are nothing if not status deciphering machines. We're also difference de deciphering machines, right? And we're very alert to any markers of difference. Um, my colleague, uh, yeah, okay, wrapping up. I think I'll, I'll be fine. Um, my colleague Nicholas de Genova has referred to this in terms of, um, it, the, it, he argues building on a gamben that it is precisely the exclusion of some that marks the inclusion of others and the boundaries of the state. And so other scholars have pointed out how within neoliberal statecraft, the functions of the state have been reduced to security and surveillance, the protection of certain economic and social elites, even while the majority is deprived of the most minimal social protections and services. So as the Black Lives Matter movement has called attention in recent months to the ways that white supremacist ideology hides in plain sight in the machinery and violence of the criminal justice system, we can also see the immigration, detention, deportation, and exploitation, and the relegations of millions of people to the shadows functions to reinforce and naturalize social inequalities and exclusions. Um, for those who believe that um, that crime is associated, immigration, rise in immigration is associated with a rise in crime, we can see that in fact the opposite is true. Um, there is even an immigrant paradox for crime that shows that white males with a high school diploma are more likely to go to prison than foreign born non-whites without one. 
Um, but far from understanding these sorts of things in public discourse, we have a normalization of hate speech um, that serves to obscure the realities of, um, of migration, but also the ethical and moral complicity of the US with the conditions that produce migration. Um, the reality is, and the question that I asked you at the beginning that received the most hands was whether me Mexican migration is at an all-time high in the United States. A majority of you said yes. Um, in fact, the vast majority of the apprehensions at the border since 2008 are of non-Mexicans. If we look at where people are coming from, we can see that the humanitarian emergency in 2014 of, um, and here we see the drop off. There's, a, there's actually more people leaving from the US to Mexico than coming into Mexico, coming into the US from Mexico at the current moment, what we call a net zero effect. It doesn't mean nobody's going anywhere, but the people coming in are balanced by the people going out. Um, if we look at where people are coming from, we can see that in fact, the, the new numbers, the big blip um, that we are seeing since 2014 is actually coming from Latin America. Um, we can see that there's a dramatic increase in um, migration of families, and in many cases, unaccompanied children um, from parts of Latin America that are in fact the parts of Latin America that have received the most intervention historically by the US, uh, both economically and politically. Um, and, and these are the, the hot spots now that are sending migrants, um, especially Honduras, San Pedro Sula, I think, is number one. Um, these are border apprehensions in 2014. You stopped hearing in 2015, and I'm going to wrap up in one minute. You're st you stopped hearing in 2014, 2015 about the migrants on the border, the unaccompanied children, child migrants. These sorts of images of children being held at detention centers along the border in Texas and Arizona were not very appealing to many people in the United States. Um, and we don't see these images today. We, there's still people being detained, but not in as large numbers. And we don't see the new arrivals every day. That is not because people have stopped coming. What we have done instead is spent, s send a good chunk of our enforcement budget to Mexico uh, for them to patrol their southern border so that people are no longer able to get up, sorry, up and out through Guatemala, they're now being stopped at that border, right? Because it is not appealing to, to the US population to think of children being stopped um, and in many cases, brutal circumstances being sent back to places they came from ex uh, trying to escape extortion and violence and gang recruitment. So instead, we have this, uh, this um, funnel, this, this you know, corking of, of the funnel so that people are not able to get across the border. Um, so it's important for us, you know, when we think about all of these ideas, to not only be attentive to where things are, where the language is being used to promote anxiety um, and, uh, and, and nervousness and um, anti-immigrant sentiment, but we also need to be attentive to the, to the connection between migratory flo flows and foreign and domestic policies. And attentive also to the way citizenship can be a means of allocating rights, but also for underlining exclusions. And we should be arguing, I believe, for a more inclusive conceptualization of rights that not only addresses the population of those excluded from citizenship rights in this country, but also the ripple effects beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Galvez. Um, our next speaker is Professor Michael Innes Jimenez. He's an associate professor of American studies at the University of Alabama. A labor historian, he's also a Clarence Mondale fellow in American studies. Professor Innes Jimenez research interests include the study of early Mexican and Mexican-American migrants to the US, Midwest, and South, Latinos and Latinas in the US, US social, cultural, and urban histories, the American West, and race and ethnicity in the Americas. He has also served as a consultant for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Latino New South Project and with the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte, North Carolina. Professor Ines Jimenez's book, Steel Barrio, The Great Mexican Migration to South Chicago, was published by New York University Press in 2013. 
Steel Barrio reconstructs the everyday strategies the working class Mexican American community adopted to survive in areas from labor to sports to activism. And this book links a particular community in South Chicago to broader issues in 20th century US history, including race and labor, urban immigration, and segregation of cities. He is currently working on two projects, Food, Culture, and Belonging in Mexican Chicago and the Latino South, A History of Migration and Race in Pursuit of the American Dream. Today he will present Them Versus Us, Rhetoric and Reality in Dehumanizing Working Class Latina Latino Immigrants. Join me in welcoming Professor Michael Inez Jimenez. Good morning, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start this morning uh, by, or start my comments this morning by taking you back to 2011, November 2011, and I realize most of y'all in here would have been what, first or second year high school at that point. Um, I spent the evening of November 21st, 2011, it was a Monday, at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. One after the other, I witnessed prominent civil rights leaders, politicians, and members of the general public stepped up to the lectern and speak about the importance of joining together, pushing back against state leaders and fighting discrimination. Terry Sewall, the U.S. Representative for the 7th District, District of Alabama, the one district that includes um, all the African-American majority counties, all of Tuscaloosa and parts of Birmingham, um, she exclaimed, now begins a new chapter in this war. Mayor William Bell of Birmingham linked the 1960s to 2011. Quote, I'm here to tell you that just as we fought in the past, we will fight now to overcome this injustice. Birmingham City Council President Roderick Royal pointed fingers. We will say no to Alabama Governor Robert Brantley. We will say no to State Senator Scott Beeson. And we will say no to State Representative Mickey Hammond and we will say no to every reincarnated George Wallace in the state of Alabama. Although they could have easily been speaking about the old and continued African-American civil rights struggle in Alabama, these African-American leaders were rallying against Alabama's anti-immigration law, or anti-immigrant law, the Beeson-Hammond Alabama Taxpayer and Citizen Protection Act. I like, it's been the, the um, custom in the last few years to make these really elegant titles for laws that don't have much to do with the law itself. But it was commonly known as HB 56. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, along with about 15 of my students from the University of Alabama, traveled a short distance to Birmingham for what was billed as a rally to kick off a statewide immigrant rights campaign. The campaign, sponsored by the a a Alabama Coalition of Immigrant Justice, was part of a public education initiative called One Family, One Alabama. Although I, I expected the crowd to be, you know, have this pep rally atmosphere, I wasn't prepared for the scale and emotion of the event. We were outside the church with about 2,200 people who had gotten there too late to get a seat in the 2,000 seat church. This venue itself is an icon of civil rights. This is the very site where four African-American girls were murdered by a KKK bomb in the midst of the campaign to desegregate the city in 1963. The 2011 event turned out to be much, much more than a rally or protest. Those of us outside of this hollowed ground of the African-American civil rights activism watched on a jumbo screen as African-American Latino and Anglo-American speakers address the need to organize and protest against de jure and de facto discrimination and harassment. For those in the crowd, admittedly a crowd already invested in human rights, this evening added faces and voices to the often anonymized, anonymous and dehumanized quote-unquote illegal immigrant. Through its location and its speakers, this remarkable event publicly linked immigrant rights in Alabama with the ongoing fight for African-American civil rights in the Birmingham area and the rest of the South. One after the other, leaders of Birmingham civil rights movement of the 60s invoked the spirit of the four little girls. 
aside from its obvious significance, these call to action or these calls to action were in response to Governor Bentley's public criticism of activists who linked early 21st century immigrant rights in Alabama to the legacy of the 1960 civil rights movement in the state. In public comments, the governor argued that, quote, it's really somewhat of an insult to the four little girls that were killed in that bombing in Birmingham and the people who were beaten here at the bus station and those that lost their homes and churches, uh, their homes and their churches were bombed. It's a disservice to them and an insult to them that went through that movement. And that comment was a direct response to an editorial in the New York Times um, linking African-American civil rights with immigrant, immigrant rights today. Governor Bentley's efforts to undermine the civil rights legitimacy of the immigrant rights movement and the One Family, One Alabama program backfired. African-American community leaders, including the church's pastor, suggested the 16th Street Baptist Church host this rally to emphasize the importance of African-Americans joining with Latinos in fighting against Alabama's newest racism, a racism codified in the new anti-immigration law. Speaking from the pulpit to the crowd inside and outside the church, UW Clemen, a civil rights activist and Alabama's first African-American um, federal judge and first chief federal judge, called for unity as he repeated the famous quote, an injury to one is an injury to all. He told Birmingham's veteran civil rights activists, the foot soldiers of the 1960s, to put, quote, their marching shoes back on and to fight back against the oppression of immigrants in Alabama. Alabama's anti-immigrant political climate, defined by rights advocates as one po powered by the politics of hate, created an impressive alliance that evening and an energy that linked organizations as well as people. The NAACP, the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, United Farm Workers, the Service Employees International Union, the AFL-CIO, Greater Birmingham Ministries, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the Birmingham City Government, along with several other organizations, joined in loud opposition to this wave of anti-immigrant rhetoric and legislation in Alabama and the rest of the South. Um, this talk this morning includes a story of what brought me, in, brought my students, or me and my students, to the rally that evening in November. It begins with two disasters, one natural and one created by politicians. Again, this, this rally's in November, let's back up to April of that year. April 15th and 27th, 2011, um, tornadoes damaged and destroyed a large swath of west and central, central and north Alabama, including um, many Latino immigrant communities. For Tuscaloosa itself, um, Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, the tornado was on the ground for over 50 miles and it was at most of the time between three quarters and one mile wide. So it destroyed 10% of the housing stock in the city and 10% in the county, including the main immigrant neighborhoods in, in Tuscaloosa. At the same time as that April 27th tornado, the, the HB 56 was working its way through the state legislature. As a matter of fact, the same day as the tornado was the first hearing in the state legislature, the state, house, the state the House of Representatives on this hearing for HB 56. The self-proclaimed toughest in the nation anti-immigration law signed in June and partially enacted in September that same year made everyday activities illegal, not only for undocumented immigrants, but also for people who came into contact with them. The tornadoes in the law collided to create a perfect storm that changed the physical, cultural, economic, and political landscape of several of the state's working class immigrant communities. Like many other Alabamians, undocumented immigrants and their families lost their lives, their homes, and their property, but unlike documented neighbors, they also feared arrest and deportation. Survivors could not easily access relief and aid readily available to the, to the rest of the community 
thus forcing them to rely even more on the informal networks and the assistance efforts of pre-existing advocacy organizations. Organizations like the Red Cross, which don't ask for, for your status, um, immigrants avoided them, rumors, a lot of rumors in this kind of situation. Um, they were avoiding the police, the National Guard is out. It's, it ended up being, um, again, informal networks and organizations linked to the local Catholic Church that helped immigrants through this um, post-tornado period. And back up a little bit more, a, a year before, the origins of this change in Alabama's political landscape came on, on November 2nd, 2010, when the Alabama electorate voted in a majority of Republicans in both legislative houses, giving control of every branch of state government, including the elected Supreme Court, um, over to conservative Republicans. It was the first time since the 1870s that both houses were Republican. What brought about this dramatic shift? The bad economy and the accompanying anti-immigrant rhetoric both played significant roles. As the economic downturn reached Alabama in December of 08, unemployment went from a late 2008 average of 3.5% to a 2009 average hovering around 10%. What followed is an American hallmark during times of crisis. That is nativism and anti-immigrant legislation and rhetoric. Indeed, HB 56, first proposed in March of 2011 and subsequently amended over the next year, had very few unintended consequences. Overall, the law sought to make everyday life difficult for immigrants. For example, the law made it a felony for undocumented immigrants to enter into any business transaction with the state of Alabama. This part of the law emphasized that public servants could be charged if they conducted business with immigrants, including standard transactions dealing with car tags, um, with driver's licenses, with business licenses. Some public officials interpreted the law as barring undocumented immigrants from access to public utilities, including drinking water, sewer, and electricity. Uh, one example, Stephen Perkle of the Decatur Utilities business manager confirmed in a newspaper interview that, quote, because of the new law, we are now going through the process to confirm that they are either citizens or an alien here legally. If they are not here legally, we will deny them service. And, again, uh, and this was followed through in several other counties, including Montgomery in Houston counties um, and several other towns. And it's something to think about for a second that um, that I think does not, when people are, are quoted and people are thinking in this way that you cannot have a transaction with the state, um, that includes drinking water. How many of us think about other countries when there is some sort of turmoil and people are denied drinking water, are denied um, electricity. This was done specifically um, based on status. And what made it so effective was that if the state bureaucrat, if the county clerk, if the teller at the driver's license office had a transaction, they were actually liable of end up uh, paying a fine or going to jail. One of the more encompassing parts of the law made all contracts between an undocumented immigrant and another person invalid. Section 27 of HB 56 provided that, quote, no court of this state shall enforce the terms of or otherwise regard as valid any contract between a party and an alien unlawfully present in the United States. That meant that at the state level, banks and car dealerships did not have to honor loan agreements child support agreements were void, as were contracts with landlords and attorneys. The state placed the burden of compliance not only on the immigrant themselves, but on anyone who, quote, looks foreign, while encouraging public officials to play it safe and avoid conducting business with anyone who might be undocumented. And this was taken to extreme with private businesses um, asking for 
for people's ID or proof of citizenship or proof of legal residency. Only three months after the law was implemented, Human Rights Watch published a scathing report on the law, a law that was designed to make life so unbearable for immigrants that they would, quote, self-deport. As a result of local interpretations of no contracts and no transactions with the state sections of HB 56, many reports came in of people being denied, again, not only water and power, but also the ability to, to live in a home. Civil rights organizations documented dozens of examples of officials denying mobile homeowners their required permit to inhabit their own property. And landlords were required to confirm legal presence before leasing a home. Although most of the provisions of HB 56 made life difficult for those who looked foreign, one in particular, Section 28, offered a telling point in the anti-immigration wave of the early 21st century. This widely reported aspect of the law required schools to collect immigration status of all students and parents when enrolling in school. Aside from the occasional misinterpretation by school officials who required proof of status before students could enroll, um, which was not the case, you just the idea was gathering data, although just bringing in parent status has a, a chilling effect on the whole education system. Um, parents and children feared harassment or detention regardless of legal status. On September 28, 2011, the day that the, this provision of the law went into effect, 2,000 um, Latino children, or about 7% of all Latino students in Alabama, didn't show up for school. Latino parents kept their kids home from, from school for fear of being detained as a parent dropping off their kids, or having their children singled out and bullied as a child of a, quote, illegal. Heart-wrenching accounts of students being bullied, being too scared to, to go to school because they didn't know if their parents would be detained and deported while they were at school, brought home the human effects of this law to many of, of students that, that I was dealing with, not only in, in, at the university, but throughout the state. Assimilation starts and traditionally has traditionally started with education. In early immigration waves to the US, boards of education, settlement houses, churches, and immigrant advocacy groups initiated the assimilation process through the formal education of immigrants, including teaching English to adults. Although there were various and at times competing reasons for assimilation, many Mexicans um, agreed, many Latin Americans agreed to learn English to improve their social contacts and economic conditions. Education of immigrants in Alabama became a flashpoint for much different reasons. While Great Depression era nativists, the, the last major economic um, the economic crisis before the, the Great Recession. While the Great Depression era natives demanded Mexican immigrants learn English and work towards U.S. citizenship, Alabama's nativists made the education of immigrant children and adults more complicated and much less inviting. To elevate anti-immigrant feelings in a state that has historically spent little money on public education, Nativists pro promulgated the incorrect perception that immigrant children were draining money from public schools at a time of teacher layoffs and cuts to public education. As, as mentioned earlier, the law required Alabama educators to gather and report the immigration status of all parents and students when they registered for public schools. Alabama lawmakers sought to make education uninviting to encourage immigrants to, again, the word self-deport, in, on behalf of their children. The popular rhetoric in Alabama incorrectly claimed that undocumented immigrants were a drain on the public education system. However, the state's tax system made the vast majority of the public school funding dependent on state sales tax, a tax paid by all who purchase products in the state. Um, New Jersey, I think, has the highest property tax rate in the country. Alabama is 49. Um, as they say down there, thank God for Mississippi, because they're always one step below. Um, 
the, the, the property taxes are low, so it's made up by sales tax. So education is covered by sales tax. In, in this context, everything I mentioned, how could I, as a, as a professor of labor and Latino history, contribute to educating, advocating, and maintaining a historical record? Shortly after the tornado, I decided to work on creating an oral history archive to preserve Latino experiences during both disasters. The vast majority of my students those first two years had experienced the tornado, a few of them having lost homes, um, and I expected a shared connection between interviewer and interviewee. To my surprise, most Latinos and service providers approached by the students agreed to be interviewed. And those interviewed included immigrants, um, Latino Americans, public school teachers, priests and pastors, and the Tuscaloosa City Police Chief. The, the majority of students in the classes, for their part, became passionate about improving recovery, re improving recovery in everyday life for immigrants. Okay, thank you. Students discussed what differences were between those what the differences were between those who embraced immigrants as a benefit to the community and those who were proud nativists. Sure, the 2009 to 13 economic downturn gave energy to nativists, but how and why was a seed planted? In the end, most students found that it was, it was a small number of Latinos, immigrants and non-immigrants in the state that made it easy to objectify the Mexican immigrant as a dehumanized other who was then viewed as a natural threat to the personal and familial us. Early on in the organization of opposition to HB 56, African American church and political leaders made it clear that they identified this new discrimination as a human and civil rights emergency and worked to consolidate support for immigrant rights. Traditionally conservative leaning Alabamians who had frequent contact with immigrants, the most obvious being farmers, construction company managers, and those in service industries, quickly objected to the law after its passage. These were people who had, who the immigrants were, were not dehumanized, were not other. U.S. immigration has long been a divisive issue. The dominant narratives of those who self-identify as American and citizens often celebrate their own ancestors' heritage and family journeys to the U.S. in some distant past, while at the same time demonizing more contemporary waves of unskilled Latin American and Asian immigrants that enter the country today. The U.S. has a history of nativist feelings and legislation in times of economic hardship. As unemployment increases, so do the formal and informal movements to rid the country of the scapegoated immigrant other through border control, arrest, and deportation. Alabama is just one part of the sweeping effort across the country to ratify anti-immigrant legislation and arguably more significantly to promote and strengthen popularized anti-immigrant sentiment through race-coded language and practices. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Innes. We have about six minutes for questions, so we have mics. So. I have a question about the, IR, the era era, as we're sorry. So what I have here is about public benefits and their, uh, the people being ineligible. So I'm doing a little section for class, so I just had to clean this up. Um, was that connected with the misdemeanors? It was part of the same law. It did a few different things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say I got a ticket for jaywalking, right? So according to the immigration policy, that would lead to deportation, right? It can, yeah. Okay, and you said something, I wish I could have recorded it about things being, uh, oh no, you answered my question, never mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, I mean, for the absolutely stimulating uh, presentations. We can't end this thing without us talking about the wall. So, <laughs> so do, do let us know in the context of a global aid, which is part of the title, there seems to be a very deep paradox in an arch-capitalist, Mr. Trump, whose money probably goes across every border in the world, uh, wants to build a wall to beat the mother of all walls. And uh, tell us a little bit more about wall. 
remember, I don't think anybody's been quite as colorful this time, but I remember last time uh, someone suggested a moat with alligators, mm -hmm. you know, on, right. uh, under the wall. Um, it's absurd. Uh, the, and, and the reason that it, continue, it doesn't go away, this idea, which is an absurd idea, no one, I mean, supposedly we want to starve the beast and not invest in the federal government, and yet we're going to have the biggest public works project since the Great Wall of China. Um, it doesn't make sense. But the reason the idea doesn't go away is that um, there's this idea that somehow immigration is uncontrolled. And that's a, that's completely false. Um, it, we are at the we we have the highest level of enforcement uh, in U.S. history, highest level of deportations in U.S. history under President Obama. Um, the the IRA IRA makes it so that people who are convicted of crimes are automatically sort of funneled into um, the deportation system and deportation proceedings. And in fact, even though Obama said he would only deport people with criminal records, he ran out of people to deport and continues deporting people who have no criminal records whatsoever, including mothers who are nursing infants. Um, so the, it, it's, it's a crazy idea, but it's, it feeds on that sort of hysteria of an uncontrolled border. Um, and in fact, you know, today the border is incredibly um, dangerous because of the blending and the interweaving of organized crime and drug trafficking with migration, because migration is um, is not um, organized or or um, the flows are not happening in an orderly or legal fashion um, because people can't get visas, then you have the situation where you know the same people who are trafficking in drugs are trafficking in people and using people as a front to, um, to, to get drugs and weapons uh, going both directions across the border. To, to add the, to that uh, just a bit, uh, two points. One is there is pretty much a virtual wall now anyway. A lot of the military equipment that's been used over the last 15, 20 years is now on the border. Motion sensors, heat sensors, drones um, are are laid out in areas that that are most frequently traveled. And the other thing, there are sections, very small sections of the walls that have been built because enough money goes in. And I think the last study I saw that the vast majority of the workers Building those walls were un were undocumented immigrants. They were hired by the companies to do that. So, we have time for one more question. There's a, there's a hand. Yeah, yeah. Pink hat. Pink hat. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone. I would like to know um, what's happening with the children that we're no longer hearing about because that's a very important issue. Like, we see the pictures on the news, and now that we're no longer seeing them, it's still important to some of us. So do you know what, what is happening with them? Yeah. Some have been reunited with their families. The vast majority had a relative here, usually a parent. Um, and so they've been reunited with their families. Once that can be established, which you can imagine is a little bit difficult to establish that relationship um, without, you know, the, the usual documents that would be used to establish it. Um, so some have been reunited while awaiting uh, hearings, which can be months or years um, away, and then it'll be determined whether or not they can stay. Um, and some have been returned. Um, those who have been returned have a very high likelihood of, of, be, of being subjected to violence upon return. Um, and some of the you know, mothers that were coming with babies, um, one of the things that's being used you know, kind of in this trend towards technology as, as a form of enforcement, a lot of them are wearing ankle bracelets, which are um, pretty extraordinary. So imagine you know, a mom taking her child to school you know, wearing an ankle bracelet. I've talked to women who have them on, and they um, run out of batteries all the time. So you're kind of tethered to electrical outlets. You can't go out of that zone very, um, you know, for very long because it'll start sending this terrible alarm sound. So, you know, you're in church and the alarm is going off. Um, they chafe and, and wear down the skin. It's a very brutal kind of system. And this idea of shackles in the 21st century is really pretty, uh, to me, horrifying. There, there are two family centers, too, right now that, that have been in the news where mothers and children are being kept. One thing to keep in mind is that it is not illegal. This is not a criminal process if you're, if you're um, 
caught not being in the U.S. legally, it's an administrative process. So these detention centers are supposed to be just a place to to be housed until you get um, until you're hearing, and and these are for all intensive purposes people that are getting treated like criminals through private prisons and through um, things like ankle bracelets. Yeah. Okay. As a moderator, I must bring the session to close. Thank you very much, Professor Galvis and Professor Imus Hemenis, for this session, and thank you all for being here this morning.